The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal. Upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, oh, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books or cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, "'tis some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, "'this it is, and nothing more. "'Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, "'but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, "'and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, "'that I scarce was sure I heard you, here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming, dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence wasn't broken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was whispered word Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon I heard again a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is someone at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what there at is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, wind with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Tis this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance he wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, Art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, Wandering from the nightly shore? Tell me what thy lordly name is On the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marvel this ungainly fowl To hear discourse so plainly thought, Its answer little meaning, Little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing That no living human being Ever yet was blessed with seeing Bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculpted bust upon his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness, broken by reply, so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is only shock in store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmercifully disaster followed, fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheel the cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, from this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, 
but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated over. But whose velvet lining with the lamplight gloated over, she shall press, ah, never more. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee. By these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether temptest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all daunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home of horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, evermore. Prophet, said I, think of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word or sign or parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight over him, streaming, throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted evermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more or see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of merriment their melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinnabulation that so musically wells, from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells, what a world of happiness their harmony foretells, through the balmy air of night how they ring out their delight, from the molten golden notes and all in tune, what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminous wells, how it swells, how it dwells on the future, how it tells of the rapture that impels through the swinging and the ringing of the bells, 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 of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now the turbulency tells, in the startled ear of night, how they scream out their affright, too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek out of tune, in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, 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 with a desperate desire, and a resolute endeavor, now, now, to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair, how they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air. 
Yet the ear it fully knows, by the twang and the clang, how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells, in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking and the swelling and the anger of the bells. Of the bells, of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn thought their monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy meaning of their tone. From every sound that flows from the rust within their throats is a groan, and the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple all alone, and who, tolling, 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 in that muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart of stone. They are neither man nor woman, they are neither brute nor human, they are ghouls, and their king it is who tolls. And he rolls, 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 a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells, and he dances and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the paean of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in the happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. End of The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe You Loom by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shurtigal The skies they were ashen and sober, The leaves they were crisp and sere, The leaves they were withering and sere. It was night in the lonesome October Of my most immemorial year. It was hard by the dim lake of Auber, in the misty mid-region of Ware. It was down by the dank tarn of Auber, in the ghoul-haunted woodland of Ware. Here once, through an alley titanic, of cypress I roamed with my soul, of cypress with psyche my soul. These were days when my heart was volcanic, as the scoriac rivers that roll, as the lavas that restlessly roll, their sulphurous currents down Yannick, in the ultimate climes of the pole that groan as they roll down Mount Yannick, in the realms of the boreal pole. Our talk had been serious and sober, but our thoughts they were palsied and sere. Our memories were treacherous and sere, for we knew not the month was October, and we marked not the night of the year. Ah, night of all nights in the year! We noted not the dim lake of Auber, though once we had journeyed down here. We remembered not the dank tarn of Auber, nor the ghoul-haunted woodland of Ware. And now, as the night was senescent, and the star-dials pointed to morn, as the star-dials hinted of morn, at the end of our path a loquescent and nebulous luster was born, out of which a miraculous crescent arose with a duplicate horn, and start his bediamonded crescent, distinct with his duplicate horn. And I said, She is warmer than Dian, she rolls through an ether of sighs, she revels in a region of sighs. She has seen that the tears are not dry on these cheeks, where the worm never dies, and has come past the stars of the lion to point us the path to the skies, to the lethean peace of the skies. Come up, in despite of the lion, to shine on us with her bright eyes. Come up through the lair of the lion, with love in her luminous eyes. But Psyche, uplifting her finger, said, Sadly this star I mistrust, her pallor I strangely mistrust. Ah, hasten, ah, let us not linger, ah, fly, let us fly, for we must. In terror she spoke, letting sink her wings till they trailed in the dust. In agony sobbed, letting sink her plumes till they trailed in the dust, till they sorrowfully trailed in the dust. I replied, this is nothing but dreaming. Let us on by this tremulous light. Let us bathe in this crystalline light, its sibilic splendor is beaming, with hope and in beauty tonight. See, it flickers up in the sky through the night. Ah, we safely may trust it to its gleaming, and be sure it will lead us aright. 
we surely may trust to a gleaming that cannot but guide us aright, since it flickers up to heaven through the night. And thus I pacified Psyche and kissed her, and I tempted her out of her gloom, and I conquered her scruples and gloom, and we passed to the end of the vista, but were stopped by the door of a tomb, by the door of a legendary tomb. And I said, What is written, sweet sister, on the door of this legendary tomb? She replied, Eulaloom, Eulaloom, tis the vault of thy lost Eulaloom. Then my heart it grew ashen sober, as the leaves that were crisped and sere, as the leaves that were withering and sere. And I cried, It was surely October, on this very night of last year, that I journeyed, I journeyed down here, that I brought a dread burden down here, on this night of all nights in the year. Ah, oh, what demon hath tempted me here? Will I know now this dim lake of Auber, this misty mid-region of Ware? Will I know now this dank tarn of Auber, this ghoul-haunted woodland of Ware? Said we then, the two then, Ah, can it have been the woodlandish ghouls, the pitiful and the merciful ghouls, to bar up our way and to ban it, from the secret that lies in these wolds, from the thing that lies hidden in these wolds? Have drawn up the specter of a planet, from the limbo of lunary souls, this sinful, scintillant planet, from the hell of planetary souls. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Ellen by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. I saw thee once, once only, years ago. I must not say how many, but not many. It was a July night, and from out a full-orbed moon that, like thine own soul, soaring, sought a precipitate pathway up through heaven, there fell a silvery silken veil of light, with quietude and saltiness and slumber, upon the upturned faces of a thousand roses that grew in an enchanted garden where no wind dared to stir unless on tiptoe fell on the upturned faces of these roses that gave out in return for the, for the love light their odorous souls in, in an ecstatic death fell on the upturned faces of these roses that smiled and died in this pottery enchanted by thee and by the poetry of thy presence clad all in white upon a violet bank I saw thee half reclining while the moon fell on the upturned faces of the roses, and on thine own upturned, alas, in sorrow. Was it not fate that on this July midnight, was it not fate, whose name is also sorrow, that bade me pause before the garden gate, to breathe the incense of those slumbering roses? No footsteps slurred, the hated world and slept, save only thee and me. O oh, heaven, O oh God, how my heart beats in coupling those two words, save only thee and me. I paused, I looked, and in an instant all things disappeared. Ah, uh, bear in mind this garden was enchanted. The pearly luster of, of the moon went out, the mossy banks and the meandering paths, the happy flowers and the repining trees, were seen no more, the very roses' odors died in the arms of adoring airs. All, all expired save thee, save less than thou, save only the divine light in thine eyes, save but the soul in thine uplifted eyes. I saw but them, they were the world to me, I saw but them, saw only them for hours, saw only them until the moon went down, what wild histories seemed to he and written upon those crystalline celestial spheres, how dark a woe, yet how sublime a hope. How silently serene a sea of pride, how daring an ambition, yet how deep, how fathomless a capacity for love. But now, at length, dear Diane sank from sight into a western couch of thunder cloud, and thou, a ghost amid the entombing trees, didst glide away. Only thine eyes remained. They would not go, they never yet have, lighting my lonely pathway home that night. They have not left me, as my hopes have, since. They follow me, they lead me through the years. They are my ministers, yet I their slave. Their office is to illumine and enkindle my duty, to be saved by their bright light and purified in their electric fire, 
and sanctified in their Elsian fire. They fill my soul with beauty, which is hope, and are far up in heaven the stars I kneel to in the sad, silent watches of my night, while even in the meridian glare of day I see them still, two sweetly scintillant Venuses, unextinguished by the sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee, and the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. End of Annabel Lee This recording is in the public domain. A Valentine by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org for her this rhyme is penned, whose luminous eyes, brightly expressive as the twins of Loetta, shall find her own sweet name that nestling lies upon the page and wrapped from every reader. Search narrowly the lines, they hold the treasure, divine, a talisman, an amulet that must be worn at heart. Search well the measure, the words, the syllables. Do not forget the trivialest point, or you may lose your labor. And yet there is in this no Gordian knot which one might not undo without a saber. If one could merely comprehend the plot, and written upon the leaf that where now appearing eyes scintillating soul, there lie heard as three eloquent words, oft uttered in the hearing of poets by poets, as the name is a poet's too. Its letters, although naturally lying, like the knight Pinto, Mendez Ferdinando, still form a synonym for truth. Cease trying, you will not read the riddle, though you do the best you can do. End of A Valentine by Edgar Allan Poe This recording is in the public domain. An Enigma by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Seldom we find, says Solomon Don Dunce, half an idea in the profoundest sonnet, through all the flimsy things we see at once, as easily as through a Naples bonnet. Trash of all trash, how can a lady don it? Yet heavier far than your Petrarchan stuff, Owl downy nonsense at the faintest puff, Twirls into trunk paper the while you con it. And veritably soul is right enough, The general tucker manatees are errant, Bubbles ephemeral and so transparent. But this is now, and you may depend upon it, Stable, opaque, immortal, all by dint, Of the dear names that lie concealed within it. End of An Enigma by Edgar Allan Poe. This recording is in the public domain. To My Mother by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. Because I feel that in the heavens above, the angels whispering to one another, can find among their burning terms of love none so devotional as that of mother. Therefore, by that dear name I long have called you. You who are more than mother unto me, and fill my heart of hearts where death installed you, in setting my Virginia spirit free. My mother, my own mother who died early, was but the mother of myself, but you are mother to the one that I loved so dearly. 
and thus are dearer than the mother I knew by that infinity with which my wife was dearer to my soul than its soul life. End of poem. This recording's in the public domain. For Annie by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Thank heaven, the crisis, the danger is past, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly I know I am shorn of my strength, and no muscle I move as I lie at full length, but no matter, I feel I am better at length, and I rest so composedly now in my bed, that any beholder might fancy me dead, might start at beholding me, thinking me dead. The moaning and groaning, the sighing and sobbing, are quieted now with that horrible throbbing at heart. Ah, oh, that horrible, horrible throbbing, the sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain, have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain, with the fever called living, that burned in my brain. And oh, of all tortures, that torture, the worst, has abated, the terrible torture of thirst, for the not lime river of passion accursed. I have drank of a water that quenches all thirst, of a water that flows with a lullaby sound from a spring about a very few feet underground, from a cavern not very far down underground. And ah, oh, let it never be foolishly said that my room it is gloomy and narrow my bed, for man never slept in a different bed, and to sleep you must slumber in just such a bed. My tantalized spirit here blandly reposes, forgetting or never regretting its roses its old agitations of myrtles and roses. For now, while so quietly lying, it fancies a holier odor about it, of pansies, a rosemary odor, commingled with pansies, with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And so it lies happily, bathing in many a dream of the truth and the beauty of Annie, drowned in a bath of the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me, she fondly caressed me, and then I fell gently to sleep on her breast deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast. When the light was extinguished, she covered me warm, and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of the angels to shield me from harm. And I lie so composedly now in my bed, knowing her love, that you fancy me dead. And I rest so contentedly now in my bed, with her love in my breast, that you fancy me dead, that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart, it is brighter than all of the many stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie, it glows with the light of the love of my Annie, with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. End of For Annie by Edgar Allan Poe This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more or see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 2F by Edgar Allan Poe Beloved, amid the earnest woes that crowd around my earthly path, drear path, alas, where grows not even one lonely rose, my soul at least is saw as half, in dreams of thee and therein knows, an Eden of bland repose, and thus thy memory is to me, like some enchanted far-off isle in some tumultuous sea, some ocean throbbing far and free, with storms but where meanwhile serenest skies continually just o'er that one bright island smile. End of 2F by Edgar Allan Poe To Francis S. Osgood by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Thou wouldst be loved? Then let thy heart from its present pathway part not, being everything which now thou art, be nothing which thou art not. So with the world thy gentle ways, thy grace, thy more than beauty, shall be an endless theme of praise, and love a simple duty. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. El Dorado by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal Gaily bedight, a gallant knight, in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song, in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this knight so bold, and over his heart a shadow fell, as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow. Ride boldly, ride, the shade replied. 
if you seek for El Dorado. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulily by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org I dwelt alone in the world of moan, and my soul was a stagnant tide, till the fair and gentle Eulily became my blushing bride, till the yellow-haired young Eulily became my smiling bride. Ah, less, less bright the stars of night than the eyes of the radiant girl, and never a flake that the vapor can make with the moon tints of purple and pearl can vie with the modest Eulily's most unregarded curl, can compare with the bright-eyed Eulily's most humble and careless curl. Now doubt, now pain, come never again, for her soul gives me sigh for sigh, and all day long shines bright and strong, a starte within the sky, while ever to her dear Eulily upturns her matron eye, while ever to her young Eulily upturns her violet eye. End of Eulily by Edgar Allan Poe. This recording is in the public domain. To Mary Louise Shue by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. Of all who hail thy presence as the morning, of all to whom thine absence is the night, the blotting utterly from out high heaven the sacred sun, of all who weeping bless thee hourly for hope, for life, ah, above all for the resurrection of deep buried faith, in truth, in virtue, in humanity, of all who on despair's unhallowed bed, lying down to die, have suddenly arisen at thy soft murmured words, let there be light, at the soft murmured words that were fulfilled in the seraphic glancing of thine eyes, of all who owe thee most, whose gratitude nearest resembles worship, oh, remember the truest, the most fervently devoted, and think that these weak lines are written by him, by him who, as he pens them, thrills to think his spirit is communing with an angel's. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The City and the Sea by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal Lo, death has reared himself a throne, in a strange city lying alone, far down within the dim west, where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. There shrines and palaces and towers, time-eaten towers that tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours. Around, by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. No rays from the holy heaven come down on the long night time of that town, but light from out the lurid sea streams up the turret silently, gleams up the pinnacles far and free, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, up shadowy long-forgotten bowers, of scaldered ivy and stone flowers, up many and many a marvellous shrine, whose wreathed friezes intertwine the veal, the violet, and the vine. Resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie, so blend the turrets and shadows there that all seem pendulous in air. While from a proud tower in the town death looks gigantically down. There open fanes and gaping graves yawn level with the luminous waves. But not the riches there that lie in each idol's diamond eye, not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed, for no ripples curl, alas, along that wilderness of glass. No swellings tell that winds may be upon some far-off happier sea. No heavings hint that winds have been on seas less hideously serene. But lo, a stir is in the air. The wave, there is movement there. As if the towers had thrown aside, in slightly sinking the dull tide, as if their tops had feebly given a void within the filmy heaven. The waves have now a redder glow. The hours are breathing faint and low. And when, amid no earthly moans, Down, down, that town shall settle hence, Hell, rising from a thousand thrones, Shall do it reverence. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Sleeper by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtical at midnight in the month of June, I stand beneath the mystic moon. An opiate vapor, dewy, dim, exhales from out her golden rim. 
and softly dripping drop by drop upon the quiet mountain top steals drowsily musically into the universal valley the rosemary nods upon the grave the lily lolls upon the wave wrapping the fog about its breast the ruin moulders into rest looking like lethe see the lake a conscious slumber seems to take and would not for the world awake all beauty sleeps and lo where lies her easement open to the skies irene with her destinies o oh, lady bright can it be right this window open to the night the wanton airs from the tree-top laughingly through the lattice drop the bodiless airs a wizard rout flit through thy chamber in and out and wave the curtain canopy so fitfully so fearfully above the closed and fringed lid neath which thy slumbering soul lies hid that over the floor and down the wall like ghosts and shadows rise and fall o oh, lady dear hast thou no fear why and what art thou dreaming here sure thou art come pure far-off seas a wonder to these garden trees strange is thy pallor strange thy dress strange above all thy length of tress and this all solemn silentness the lady sleeps O oh, may her sleep which is enduring so be deep heaven have her in its sacred keep this chamber changed for one more holy this bed for one more melancholy i pray to god that she may lie forever with unopened eye while the dim sheeted ghosts go by my love she sleeps O oh, may her sleep as it is lasting so be deep soft may the worms about her creep far in the forest dim and old for her may some tall vault unfold some vault that oft hath flung its black and winged panels fluttering back triumphant over the crested pals of her grand family funerals some sepulchre remote alone against whose portal she hath thrown in childhood many an idle stone some tomb from out whose sounding door she never shall force an echo more thrilling to think poor child of sin it was the dead who groaned within end of recording this recording is in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. bridal ballad by edgar Allan poe recorded for LibriVox.org. the ring is on my hand and the wreath is on my brow Satins and jewels grand are all at my command, and I am happy now. And my lord, he loves me well, but when first he breathed his vow, I felt my bosom swell, for the words rang as he knell, and the voice seemed his who fell in the battle down the dell, and who is happy now. But he spoke to reassure me, and he kissed my pallid brow, while well, wherever he came over me, and to the churchyard bore me, and I sighed to him before me, thinking him dead, dear lord me. Oh, I am happy now, and thus the words were spoken, and this the plighted vow, and though my faith be broken, and though my heart be broken, behold the golden token that proves me happy now. Would God I could awaken, for a dream I know not how, and my soul is sorely shaken, lest an evil step be taken, lest the dead who is forsaken may not be happy now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lenore by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Schertigal On the 11th of May, 2007 Ah, broken is the golden bowl, The spirit flown forever. Let the bell toll, A saintly soul floats in the Stygian river. And guide a very, hast thou no tear? Weep now, or never more. See yon yon drear and rigid bier, Low lies thy love, Lenore. Come, let the burial rite be read, the funeral song be sung, an anthem for the queenliest dead that ever died so young, a dirge for her the doubly dead in that she died so young. Wretches, ye loved her for her wealth and hated her for her pride, and when she fell in feeble health, ye blessed her that she died. How shall the ritual then be read, the requiem how be sung, by you, by yours, the evil eye? By yours the slanderous tongue, That did to death the innocent that died, And died so young. 
Pecavimus, but rave not thus, and let a Sabbath song go up to God, so solemnly the dead may feel so wrong. The sweet Lenore hath gone before, with hope, that flew beside, leaving thee wild for the dear child that should have been thy bride. For her, the fair and debonair that now so lowly lies, the life upon her yellow hair, but not within her eyes, the life still there upon her hair, the death upon her eyes. Avaunt, to-night my heart is light, no dirge will I upraise, but waft the angel on her flight with the pain of old days. Let no bell toll, lest her sweet soul, amid his hollowed mirth, should catch the note as it doth float, up from the damned earth, to friends above, from fiends below. The indignant ghost is riven from hell, upon a high estate far up within the heaven, from grief and groan to a golden throne beside the king of heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To One in Paradise by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Thou wast all that to me, love, for which my soul did pine, A green isle in the sea, love, a fountain and a shrine, All wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers, and all the flowers were mine. Ah, dream too bright to last, ah, starry hope that didst arise but to be overcast. A voice from out the future cries, on, on, but over the past, dim gold, my spirit hovering lies, mute, motionless, aghast. For alas, alas, with me the light of life is over. No more, no more, no more, such language holds the solemn sea to the sands upon the shore. Shall bloom the thunder o' blasted tree, or the stricken eagle soar. And all my days are trances, and all my nightly dreams are where thy dark eye glances and where thy footstep gleams, in what eternal dances, by what eternal streams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Coliseum by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal Type of the antique Rome, rich well aquary of lofty contemplation left to time, by buried centuries of pomp and power, at length, at length, after so many days of weary pilgrimage and burning thirst, thirst for the springs of lore that in thee lie, I kneel, an altered and a humble man, amid thy shadows, and so drink within my very soul thy grandeur, gloom, and glory, vastness and age and memories of eld, silence and desolation and dim night. I feel ye now, I feel ye in your strength, O oh, spells more sure than ever Judean king taught in the gardens of Gethsemane. O oh, charms more potent than the rapt child he ever drew down from out the quiet stars. Here, where a hero fell, a column falls. Here, where the mimic eagle glared in gold, a midnight vigil holds the swarthy bat. Here, where the dames of Rome, their gilded hair waved in the wind. Now wave the reeds and thistle. Here, where on golden throne the monarch lolled, gilds spectre-like unto his marble home lit by the wan light, the swift and silent lizard of the stones. But stay, these walls, these ivy-clad arcades, these mouldering plinths, these sad and blackened shafts, these vague entablatures, this crumbling phrase, these shattered cornices, this wreck, this ruin, these stones, alas, these grey stones, are they all all of the famed and the colossal left by the corrosive hours of fate in me. Not all, the echoes answer me, not all. Prophetic sounds and loud arise forever from us and from all ruin unto the wise. As melody of Memnon to the sun, we rule the hearts of mightiest men. We rule with a despotic sway all giant minds. We are not impotent, we pallid stones. Not all our power is gone. Not all our fame, not all the magic of our high renown, not all the wonder that encircles us, not all the mysteries that in us lie, not all the memories that hang upon and cling around about us as a garment, clothing us in a robe of more than glory. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
The Haunted Palace by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, Once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, Reared its head, in the monarch thought's dominion, It stood there, never seraph spread opinion Over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, On its roof did float and flow, this, all this, was in the olden time, long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, Along the ramparts, plumed and pallid, A winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, Through two luminous windows saw, Spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law. Round about a throne were sitting, Porthorogene, in state his glory well befitting, The ruler of the realm was seen, and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door through which came flowing 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 and sparkling evermore a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate ah let us mourn for never sorrow shall dawn upon him desolate and round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of their old time entombed and travellers now within that valley through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody while lie a ghastly rapid river through the pale door a hideous throng rush out for ever and laugh but smile no more End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conqueror Worm by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Lo, tis a gala night within the lonesome latter years, An angel throng, bewinged bedight in veils, and drowned in tears, Sit in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears. While the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres, Mimes in the form of God on high Mutter and mumble low and hither and thither fly, Mere puppets they who come and go At bidding of vast formless things That shift the scenery to and fro, Flapping from out their condor wings Invisible woe. That motley drama, oh, be sure it shall not be forgot, With its phantom chased forevermore By a crowd that sees it not, Through a circle that ever returneth into the self-same spot, and much of madness and more of sin, and horror the soul of the plot. But see, amid the mimic root, a crawling shape intrude, a blood-red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes, with mortal pangs, the mimes become its food, and the angels sob at vermin fangs, and human gore imbued. Out, out are the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain of funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm, and the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy of man, and its hero, the conqueror worm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Silence by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org there are some qualities, some incorporate things, that have a double life, which thus is made a type of that twin entity which springs from matter and light, invinced in solid and shade. There is a twofold silence, sea and shore, body and soul. One dwells in lonely places, newly with grass overgrown. Some solemn graces, some human memories and tearful lore, render him terrorless, his names no more. He is the corporate silence, dread him not. No power hath he of evil in himself, but should some urgent fate, untimely lot, bring thee to meet his shadow, nameless elf that haunteth the lone regions, where hath trod no foot of man, commend thyself to God. End of Silence by Edgar Allan Poe This recording is in the public domain. Dreamland by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, Where an Edelon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I've reached these lands but newly from an ultimate dim Thule, 
from a wild, weird clime that lieth sublime, out of space, out of time. Bottomless vales and boundless floods and chasms and caves and titan woods, with forms that no man can discover from the dews that drip all over, mountains toppling evermore into seas without a shore, seas that restlessly aspire, surging unto skies of fire, lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, their still waters, still and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the lakes that thus outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, their sad waters, sad and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily, by the mountains near the river, murmuring lowly, murmuring ever, by the gray woods, by the swamp where the toad and the newt encamp, by the dismal tarns and pools where dwell the ghouls, by each spot the most unholy, in each nook most melancholy, where the traveler meets aghast, sheared memories of the past, shrouded forms that start and sigh as they pass the wanderer by, white-robed forms of friends long given in agony to the earth and heaven. For the heart whose woes are legion, tis a peaceful, soothing region. For the spirit that walks in shadow, tis, oh, tis an Eldorado. But the traveler traveling through it may not dare openly view it. Never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye enclosed. So wills its king, who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid, and thus the sad soul that here passes beholds it but through darkened glasses. By a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Edelon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have wandered home but newly from this ultimate dim Thule. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hymn by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibVox.org At morn, at noon, at twilight dim, Maria, thou hast heard my hymn, In joy and woe, in good and ill, Mother of God, be with me still. When the hours flew brightly by, And not a cloud obscured the sky, My soul, lest it should truant be, Thy grace did guide to thine and thee. Now, when storms of fate overcast, Darkling my present and my past, let my future radiant shine with sweet hopes of thee and thine. End of him by Edgar Allan Poe. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more or so you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Zante by Edgar Allan Poe. Fair isle, that from the fairest of all flowers, thy gentlest of all gentle names, dost take. How many memories of what radiant hours set sight of thee and thine at once wake. How many scenes of what departed bliss. How many thoughts of what entombed hopes. How many visions of a maiden that is no more. No more upon thy verdant slopes. No more, alas, that magical sad sound. Transforming all, thy charms shall please no more, thy memory no more, a cursed ground. Henceforth I hold thy flower-enameled shore, O hyacinth thine isle, O purple Zante, I so adieu fior di lavante. End of To Zante by Edgar Allan Poe Sonnet to Science by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Science, true daughter of old time, thou art, who alterest all things with thy peering eyes. Why prayest thou thus upon the poet's heart, vulture whose wings are dull realities? How should he love thee, or how deem thee wise? Who wouldst not leave him in his wandering to seek for treasure in the jeweled skies, albeit he soared with an undaunting wing? Hast thou not dragged Diana from her car, and driven the hammer dryad from the wood to seek a shelter in some happier star? Hast thou not torn the naiad from her flood, the elfin from the green grass, and from me the summer dream beneath the tamarind tree? End of Sonnet to Science This recording is in the public domain. The Forest Reverie by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Schertigal Tis said that when the hands of men tame this primeval wood, and oary trees with groans of woe, like soldiers by an unknown foe, were in their strength subdued. The virgin earth gave instant birth to springs that never did flow, that in the sun did rivulets run, and all around rare flowers did blow. The wild rose pale perfumed the gale, and the queenly lily adown the dale, 
whom the sun and the dew and the winds did woo, with the gourd and the grape luxuriant grew. So when in tears the love of years is wasted like the snow, and the fine fibrils of its life by the rude wrong of instant strife are broken of the blow, within the heart do springs up start, of which it doth now know, in strange sweet dreams like silent streams that from new fountains overflow, with the earlier tide of rivers glide, deep in the heart whose hope has died, quenching the fires its ashes hide, its ashes whence will spring and grow, sweet flowers ere long the rare and radiant flowers of song. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Valley of Unrest by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal. Once it smiled a silent dell where the people did not dwell. They had gone into the wars, trusting to the mild-eyed stars, nightly from their azure towers, to keep watch above the flowers, in the midst of which all day the red sun light lazily lay. Now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness. Nothing there is motionless, nothing save the airs that brood over the magic solitude. Ah, by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty Hebrides. Ah, by no wind those clouds are driven that wrestle through the unquiet heaven, uneasily from morn till even. Over the violets there that lie in myriad types of the human eye, over the lilies there that wave and weep above a nameless grave, they wave, from out their fragrant tops, eternal dews come down in drops. They weep, from out their delicate stems, perennial tears descend in gems. End of The Valley of Unrest by Edgar Allan Poe. This recording is in the public domain. To find out more or see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Israfel by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. In heaven a spirit doth dwell, whose heart-strings are a lute. None sings so wildly well as the angel Israfel, and the giddy stars, so legends tell, ceasing their hymns attend the spell of his voice all mute. Tottering above in her highest noon, the enamored moon blushes with love, while to listen the red levin, with the rapid pleiads, even which were seven, pauses in heaven, and they say, the starry choir and all the listening things, that is Raphael's fire is owing to that lyre by which he sits and sings, the trembling living wire of those unusual strings. But the skies the angel trod, where deep thoughts are a duty, where love's a grown up god, where the hoary glances are imbued with all the beauty which we worship in a star. Therefore thou art not wrong, Israfel, who despisest an unimpassioned song. To thee the laurels belong, best bard, because the wisest merrily live and long. The ecstasies above with thy burning measures suit, thy grief, thy joy, thy hate, thy love, with the fervor of thy lute, well may the stars be mute. Yes, heaven is thine, but this is a world of sweets and sours. Our flowers are merely flowers, and the shadow of thy perfect bliss is the sunshine of ours. If I could dwell where Israfel hath dwelt, and he were I, he might not sing so wildly well. A mortal melody, where a bolder note than this might swell from my lyre within the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Blank by Ed Ground Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. The bowers where at in dreams I see, the wanton singing birds, our lips and all thy melody of lip begotten words, thine eyes in heaven of heart enshrined. Then desolately fall, O God, on my funeral mind, Like starlight on a pall. Thy heart, thy heart, I wake and sigh, And sleep to dream till day, Of truth that gold can never buy, Of the trifles that it may. End of To Blank This recording is in the public domain. To Blank by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org I heed not that my earthly lot hath little of earth in it. The years of love have been forgot in the hatred of a minute. I mourn not that the desolate are happier sweet than I, but that you sorrow for my fate who am a passer-by. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the River by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. Fair river, in thy bright clear flow of crystal wandering water, thou art an emblem of the glow of beauty, the unhidden heart, the playful maziness of art, in old Alberto's daughter. But when within thy wave she looks, which glistens then and trembles, why then the prettiest of brooks her worshipper resembles? For in my heart, as in thy stream, her image deeply lies, his heart which trembles at the beam of her soul-searching eyes. End of To the River by Edgar Allan Poe This recording is in the public domain. Song by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org I saw thee on thy bridal day, when a burning blush came over thee. Though happiness around thee lay, the world all love before thee. And in thine eye a kindling light, whatever it might be, Was all on earth my aching sight of loveliness could see. That blush, perhaps, was made in shame, as such it well may pass, Though its glow hath raised a fiercer flame in the breast of him, alas, Who saw thee on that bridal day, when that deep blush would come over thee, Though happiness around thee lay, the world all love before thee. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Spirits of the Dead by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shurtigal Thy soul shall find itself alone Mid dark thoughts of the grey tombstone Not one of all the crowd To pry into thine hour of secrecy Be silent in that solitude Which is not loneliness for then the spirits of the dead who stood in life before thee are again in death around thee, and their will shall then overshadow thee. Be still, for the night, though clear, shall frown, and the stars shall look not down from their high thrones in the heaven with light like hope to mortals given. But the red orbs without beam to thy weariness shall seem as a burning and a fever which would cling to thee for ever. Now are thoughts thou shalt not banish, now are visions never to vanish, from thy spirit shall they pass, no more like dewdrop from the grass. The breeze, the breath of God, is still, and the mist upon the hill, shadowy, shadowy, yet unbroken, is a symbol and a token, how it hangs upon the trees, a mystery of mysteries. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dream by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org In visions of the dark night I have dreamed of joy departed, But awaking dreams of life and light Hath left me broken-hearted. Ah, what is not accompanied by day To him whose eyes are cast On things around him with a ray Turned back upon the past? That holy dream, that holy dream, While all the world were chiding, Hath cheered me as the lovely beam, A lonely spirit guiding. What through that light, through storm and night, So trembled from afar, What could there be more purely bright In truth's day star? End of A Dream by Edgar Allan Poe this recording is in the public domain. Romance by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org Romance who loves to nod and sing With drowsy head and folded wing Among the green leaves as they shake Far down within some shadowy lake To me a painted parakeet hath been A most familiar bird Taught me my alphabet to say To lisp my very earliest word while in the wild wood I did lie, a child with a most knowing eye. Of late eternal condor years, so shake the very heaven on high, With tumult as they thunder by, I have no time for idle cares, Through gazing on the unquiet sky. And when an hour with calmer wings its down upon thy spirit flings, That little time with lyre and rhyme to while away forbidden things, my heart would feel to be a crime unless it trembled with the strings. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fairyland by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal on the 11th of May 2007. Dim veils and shadowy floods and cloudy looking woods, whose forms we can't discover for the tears that drip all over. Huge moons their wax and wane. Again, again, again. Every moment of the night, forever changing places, and they put out the starlight with the breath from their pale faces. About twelve by the moon dial, one more filmy than the rest, a kind which upon trial they have found to be the best, comes down, still down and down, with its centre on the crown of a mountain's eminence, while its wide circumference in easy drapery falls, over hamlets, over halls, wherever they may be, over the strange woods, over the sea, over spirits on the wing, over every drowsy thing, and buries them up quite in the labyrinth of light. And then, how deep, O oh deep, is the passion of their sleep! In the morning they arise, and their moony covering is soaring in the skies, with the tempest as they toss, like almost anything, or a yellow albatross. They use that moon no more for the same end as before, Videlis into tent, which I think extravagant. Its autonomies, however, into a shower dissever, of which those butterflies of earth who seek the skies, and so come down again, never contented things, have brought a specimen upon their quivering wings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lake to Blank by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org. In spring of youth it was my lot to haunt of the wide earth a spot, the which I could not love the less, so lovely was the loneliness of a wild lake with black rock bound, and tall pines that towered around. But when the night had thrown her pall upon that spot as upon all, and the mystic wind went by murmuring in melody, then, ah, then I would awake to the terror of the lone lake. Yet that terror was not fright, but a tremulous delight, a feeling not the jeweled mine could teach or bribe me to define, nor love, although the love were thine. Death was in that poisonous wave, and in its gulf a fitting grave, for him who thence could solace bring to his lone imagining, whose solitary soul could make an Eden of that dim lake. End of poem. This recording's in the public domain. Evening Star by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org T'was noontide of summer and midtide of night, And stars in their orbits shone pale through the light Of the brighter cold moon, Mid planets her slaves, herself in the heavens, Her beam on the waves, I gazed a while on her cold smile, Too cold, too cold for me, There passed the shroud of fleecy cloud, And I turned away to thee, Proud evening star in thy glory afar, and dearer thy beam shall be, for joy to my heart is the proud part thou bearest in heaven at night, and more I admire thy distant fire than that colder, lowly light. End of An Evening Star by Edgar Allan Poe. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more or see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Happiest Day by Edgar Allan Poe The happiest day, the happiest hour, my seared and blighted heart hath known. The highest hope of pride and power I feel hath flown. Of power, said I, yes, such I ween, but they have vanished long, alas, the visions of my youth have been, but let them pass. And pride, what have I now with thee? Another brow may even inherit the venom thou hast poured on me. Be still, my spirit. The happiest day, the happiest hour, mine eyes shall see, have ever seen. The brightest glance of pride and power I feet have been. But were that hope of pride and power now offered with the pain, even then I felt that brightest hour I would not live again. For on its wing was dark alloy, and as it fluttered fell, an essence powerful to destroy, a soul that knew it well. End of The Happiest Day by Edgar Allan Poe Imitation by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org 
A dark, unfathomed tide of interminable pride, a mystery and a dream should my early life seem. I say that dream was fraught with a wild and waking thought of beings that have been, which my spirit hath not seen. Had I let them pass me by with a dreaming eye, let none of earth inherit that vision of my spirit, whose thoughts I would control as a spell upon his soul. For that bright hope at last, and that light time have passed, and my worldly rest hath gone with a sigh as it passed on. I care not though it perished with a thought I then did cherish. End of Imitation by Edgar Allan Poe This recording is in the public domain. Hymn to Aristogenton and Hermodius Recorded for LibriVox.org Wreathed in myrtle my sword I'll conceal, Like those champions devoted and brave, When they plunged from the tyrant their steel, And Athens deliverance gave. Beloved heroes, your deathless souls roam in the joy-breathing isles of the blest, where the mighty of old have their home, where Achilles and Diamond rest. In fresh myrtle my blade I'll entwine, like Hermodius the gallant and good, when he made the tutelar shrine a libation of tyranny's blood. Ye deliverers of Athens from shame, ye avengers of liberty's wrongs, endless ages shall cherish your fame. Embalmed in their echoing songs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dreams by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal. Oh, that my young life were a lasting dream, my spirit not awakened, till the beam of an eternity should bring the morrow. Yes, though that long dream were of hopeless sorrow. T'were better than the dull reality Of waking life to him whose heart shall be, And hath been ever on the chilly earth A chaos of deep passion from his birth. But should it be that dream eternally continuing As dreams have been to me in my young boyhood, Should it thus be given, T'were folly still to hope for higher heaven. For I have reveled when the sun was bright In the summer sky, in dreamy fields of light, and left unheedingly my very heart in climes of mine imagining, apart from mine own home, with beings that have been of mine own thought. What more could I have seen? T'was once, and only once, and the wild hour for my remembrance shall not pass. Some power or spell has bound me. T'was the chilly wind came over me in the night, and left behind its image on my spirit, or the moon shone on my slumbers in her lofty noon, too coldly on the stars, however it was, that dream was as that night wind. Let it pass. I have been happy, though but in a dream. I have been happy, and I love the theme. Dreams in their vivid coloring of life, as in that fleeting, shadowy, misty strife, of semblance with reality, which brings to the delirious eye more lovely things of paradise and love, and all our own, the young hope in his sunniest hour hath known. End of recording. This poem is in, this recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Youth I Have Known One by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal. How often we forget all time when low to admire nature's universal throne. Her woods, her wilds, her mountains, the intense reply of hers to our intelligence. In youth I have known one with whom the earth in secret communing held, as he with it in daylight and in beauty, from his birth whose fervid flickering torch of life was lit from the sun and stars, whence he had drawn forth a passionate light such as his spirit was fit, and yet that spirit knew not in the hour of its own fervor what had over it power. Perhaps it may be that my mind is wrought to a fever by the moonbeam that hangs over, but I will half believe that wild light fraught with more of sovereignty than ancient lore hath ever told, or is it of a thought, the unembodied essence, and no more, that with a quickening spell doth over us pass, as dew of the night-time over the summer grass, doth over us pass, when, as the expanding eye to the loved object, so the tear to the lid will start, which lately slept in apathy. And yet it need not be that object hid from us in life, 
but comet which doth lie each hour before us. But then only bid with a strange sound, as of a harp string broken, to wake us, to the symbol and a token, of what in other words shall be, and given in beauty by our God to those alone, who otherwise would fall from life and heaven, drawn by their heart's passion and that tone, that high tone in the spirit which hath striven, though not with faith in godliness, whose throne with desperate energy hath beaten down, wearing its own deep feeling as a crown. A new poem. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Paean by Edgar Allan Poe. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal. How shall a burial rite be read, the solemn song be sung, the requiem for the loveliest dead that ever died so young? Her friends are gazing on her, and on her gaudy bier, and weep, oh, to dishonor dead beauty with a tear. They loved her for her wealth, and they hated her for her pride, but she grew in feeble health, and they love her, that she died. They tell me, while they speak of her costly broidered pall, that my voice is growing weak, that I should not sing at all, or that my tone should be tuned to such solemn song, so mournfully, so mournfully that the dead may feel no wrong. But she has gone above with young hope at her side, and I am drunk with love of the dead who is my bride. Of the dead, dead who lies all perfumed there with the death upon her eyes and the life upon her hair. Thus on the coffin loud and long I strike, the murmur sent through the gray chambers to my song shall be the accompaniment. Thou diedest in thy life's June, but thou didst not die too fair. Thou didst not die too soon, nor with too calm an air. For more than fiends on earth thy life and love were riven, to join the untainted mirth of more than thrones in heaven. Therefore to thee this night I will no requiem raise, but waft thee on thy flight with a pain of old days. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more or see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alone by Edgar Allan Poe From childhood's hour I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw, I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken my sorrow, I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, I was drawn from every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still, from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me ruled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form, when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. End of Alone by Edgar Allan Poe The Village Street by Edgar Allan Poe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal In these rapid, restless shadows, once I walked even tide, when a gentle, silent maiden walked in beauty at my side. She alone there walked beside me, all in beauty, like a bride. Pallidly the moon was shining on the dewy mountains, nigh on the silvery, silent rivers, on the mountains far and high, in the ocean's starlit waters, where the winds a weary die. Slowly, silently, we wandered from the open cottage door underneath the elm's long branches to the pavement bending over underneath the mossy willow and the dying sycamore. With the myriad stars and beauty, all bedight in the heavens were seen. Radiant hopes were bright around me, like the light of stars serene, like the mellow midnight splendor of the night's radiant queen. Audibly the elm leaves whispered, peaceful, pleasant melodies, like the distant murmured music of unquiet, lovely seas. 
while the winds were hushed in slumber and the fragrant flowers and trees wondrous and unwonted beauty still adorning all did seem while i told my love in fables neath the willows by the stream would the heart have kept unspoken love that was its rarest dream instantly away we wandered in the shadowy twilight tide she the silent scornful maiden walking calmly at my side with a step serene and stately all in beauty all in pride vacantly i walked beside her on the earth mine eyes were cast swift and keen there came unto me ridden memories of the past on me like the rain in autumn on the dead leaves cold and fast underneath the elms we parted by the lowly cottage door one brief word alone was uttered never on our lips before and away i walked forlornly broken-hearted evermore slowly silently i loitered homeward in the night alone sudden anguish bound my spirit that my youth have never known wild rest like that which cometh when the night's first dream hath flown now to me the elm leaves whispered mad discordant melodies and keen melodies like shadows haunt the moaning willow trees and the sycamores with laughter mock me in the nightly breeze sad and pale the autumn moonlight through the sighing foliage streams and each morning midnight shadow shadow of my sorrow seems strive o heart forget thine idol and o soul forget thy dreams End of The Village Street by Edgar Allan Poe. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to see how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.